For sale, a 1953 Corvette in great condition must sell $10,000 or best offer. Tony pulled up to the gate of the address he had been given and was met by an old woman. Good morning, young man, Clara said. Have you come to see the car? You betcha. Well, follow me and stay on the road. Tony edged his car forward as she opened the gate. Once through, she closed and locked the gate behind them, then hobbled past him and struggled to get into her own car, a 1957 Ford Fairlane. They drove the dirt road for what seemed like forever and finally crested a slight rise. A large farmhouse was flanked by outbuildings and a dilapidated barn that looked like a good wind would blow it over. She pulled her car up to it and parked in front. Tony got out of his car and put on his best smile. So, young man, why are you interested in my car? I read the ad in the newspaper, and my car isn't running so great, he said, pointing to his immaculate late model BMW. Well, I don't know much about cars. I'm not sure if this one will suit your needs or not. They stepped inside, and she stooped over to grab the front end of a large tarp. Wincing in pain, she pulled it slowly towards the back. Then she went around to the other side, past Tony, and pulled the rest of the tarp off. It was all Tony could do not to drool. He tried to keep his cool while he examined the mint-conditioned car. Hmm, he said, opening the hood. Is something wrong, young man? It's just that your Hasselhoff valve has been wired backward. Oh dear, is that bad? It's just expensive to fix. How expensive? It's hard to say. Tony rubbed the back of his neck. Around 3,000. Oh my, is there anything else wrong with it? It looks like your Dusseldorf compensator is jammed. That's another thousand. So, how much do you think I should sell it for? Seeing the condition it's in, he said, rubbing his chin. I'll give you five thousand for it. That's half of what I was asking, she said thoughtfully. I guess we'll have to eat a little less this winter. That's my best offer. Take it or leave it. She rubbed the fender lovingly, then bowed her head and sighed. I suppose I'll take it. Great, I'll just make a quick call, he said, turning his back to her. Oh, there's no cell service out here, she said as she cracked the side of his head with a baseball bat. We wouldn't want you calling for help. That would ruin everything. He lay on the ground, stunned when she lifted the bat and sent it whistling toward his skull again. It struck with more power than she seemed to have in her ancient body. He tried to crawl away, but she savagely swung, again and again, connecting each time with his skull, splattering red and eventually gray. Hasselhoff valve? Smack. Dusseldorf compensator? Smack. Who's the fool now? She said, hovering over him with a maniacal grin. You came out here to the middle of nowhere, alone, thinking you were going to steal from me? Tony tried to say something, but all that came out was the bloody gurgle of his final breath. Breathing hard, Chloris hovered over the body when a large man wearing bloody coveralls walked up behind her. She whipped around, bat at the ready. Oh, it's just you, Tom. Another one? He said, assessing the pool of blood and the corpse lying in it. You would think we had a sign out front that said, please rob us. I guess they'll never learn. You know what to do. Take the body to the butcher barn and drive the car down to the warehouse with the rest. I'll clean up here. Why the rush? I have another buyer coming in about 20 minutes. At this rate, we'll have enough meat for the next three winters. Tom said as he picked up the body and walked away. Meanwhile, Chloris threw sawdust over the bloody floor, then wiped any blood flecks off the car and covered it back up. She had just finished and drove out to the gate 
when a pickup truck pulled up. Good morning, David said cheerfully. Good morning to you, sir. I hope I'm not taking you away from anything important. Just taking care of some trash. She grinned. Follow me, please. He followed her down the road to the old barn. May I help you with that? He asked as she pulled the tarp off. That would be very nice, young man. Wow, she's a beauty, he said as they laid the tarp on the ground. He admired the interior while reaching for the hood release. May I be my guest? He popped the hood and his eyes grew wide when he saw the engine. He slowly circled the car in silence, examining every inch of it. When he was done, he took a deep breath. Miss, there's no way I could possibly give you 10,000 for this car. Oh, really? She said, subtly reaching for her bat. Why is that? Because it's worth at least 60. What? I've never seen one of these cars in such immaculate condition. You need to change that ad right away. Quite frankly, I'm amazed someone hasn't stolen this beauty from you for only 10,000. So you don't want the car? On the contrary, I want it very much, but unfortunately, I don't have the money to pay you a fair amount. Cloris stood spellbound, admiring the honesty of this young man. The spell was broken when the bat fell over. She reached out and shook his hand. Thank you, young man, for putting my welfare above your own. He shook it and smiled. You're very welcome. I think you should keep this car. By the way, you've taken care of it. I can tell that you love it. I think I will. Thank you for letting me see this beauty. Thank you. I'll lead you back to the gate. He walked over to his truck and patiently waited. You're letting him go, Tom whispered. He was the first one in years to tell me what the car was really worth. Maybe there's some good left in this world. Tom eyed her. You're not getting soft on me, are ya? She slapped him playfully. Hush up. She led David back, unlocked the gate, and waved as he drove away. The truck was barely out of sight when a late model Corvette pulled up. Good morning, Cloris said. Have you come to see the car? This is my confession. I'm writing it down as a record. If anyone reads it, I'll be long gone. This is to let people know what really happened. I live in fear that a certain someone will find out I've told the story. It all started because of a dog. The nurse came out to the waiting room and called my name. I came over to her and she handed me a leash and a collar. I'm sorry, sir, there was nothing we could do, she said. I looked down at the empty collar that used to belong to my best friend, my dog, Jack. Do you know what happened? I said, fighting back tears. We couldn't be sure but there was something in his bloodstream that caused him to deteriorate quickly. You mean like poison? I wouldn't say that, but there seemed to be some toxins in his system. So, it could have been poison. Do you keep all of your household cleaners locked away? Of course, I said. What are you saying? That I did this to my dog? No, it's just sometimes animals get into things they shouldn't. I didn't poison my dog, I said louder than I should have, causing other pet owners in the room to look. I never said you did, sir. I just said that I'm a negligent pet owner, I said, standing up and glaring at her. Well, let me tell you something. That dog has been like a brother to me for over 12 years. I would never let anything happen to him. I'm sorry, sir, she said, backing away. I didn't mean to upset you. She dashed behind the counter, leaving me holding the leash and collar. I turned and walked out in a haze, got in my car, and headed for home with the leash and collar on the seat beside me where Jack always sat. I pressed the button and lowered the passenger side window a few inches out of habit 
so Jack could stick his nose out. Realizing what I'd done, my finger hovered over the button to roll up the window, but I couldn't do it. Tears streamed down my face as the cool spring air rushed in. But I left the window down in one last tribute to Jack. I wiped my eyes with my sleeve so I could see where I was going. My thoughts were jumbled up. Could I have caused Jack's death? I had everything closed up in the house. He never showed any interest in the things he shouldn't, anyway. Ever since we moved to the suburbs, he seemed happier than ever. He loved having so much room to run around in rather than just the community park in the middle of the city. The only problem he had was learning where the boundary lines were. The first time he dug up neighbor Johnson's flower bed, I scolded him almost as much as the neighbor scolded me. The old man wasn't the friendliest. In fact, he was one mean SOB. I had several neighbors who said to steer clear of old man Johnson. That's pretty tough to do when you're literally his next door neighbor. But I tried to keep Jack out of his flowers and away from his property. Unfortunately, Jack had our ideas. Every time I let him out, he would wait until my back was turned, then head for Mr. Johnson's flowers. I followed him and kept him away most of the time, but sometimes he was too slick. He started running around to the front of the house. While I was looking for him, he would circle around and come right back over to the neighbor's flowers. Mr. Johnson threatened to call the police. Then when that didn't work, he threatened to take matters into his own hands. I never thought he'd do it though. I was sure it was an empty threat. I mean, come on, they're just flowers. When I arrived home, he was out working on his flowers. I saw him sneak peeks at me as I took my empty collar into the house. I knew right then he had done it. My mind burned for revenge, but there was no way for me to prove it. I decided to let it go and focus on being a good neighbor. I had moved out to the country because I couldn't stand living in the city anymore. Well, I say, I moved to the country, but it was more like the suburbs. Or the outskirts of the suburbs. I had neighbors, just not many. There were three houses on my side of the road and four on the opposite side. Each of us had a spacious backyard that was nearly an acre. It stretched back into the forest. This neighborhood had been carved out of years ago. I came here around four months ago and tried my best to blend in with the neighbors. For the most part, I succeeded. I bought what everyone else recommended I should have. A riding mower with a mulcher and bag attachment that vacuums up the grass into bags so it doesn't lay around on the ground. I got the hedge trimmer, even though I don't have any hedges, should I decide to grow some. I got the chainsaw in case I ever decided to cut some firewood out of my stretch of forest. And lastly, I bought a row tiller just in case I ever needed a garden. I can honestly say I'd never seen a Rotu tiller up close and personal until it was delivered to my garage. In fact, there were a lot of things in my garage that I had only seen for the first time, including a wheelbarrow. Living in an apartment for most of my life meant mowing, trimming, and gardening were foreign to me. My neighbor on the other side, Steve, is my sounding board and gossip for the neighborhood. I told him about Jack. Man, I'll tell you what, he said. If he did that to my dog, I'd cut him up in little pieces and bury him out in the trees. You don't have a dog, I said. That's not the point. The point is, he had no business doing that. Yeah, I said, taking a long drink of beer. You've got to get him back, Steve said with a gleam in his eye. What are you, in fifth grade? Come on, man. You can't tell me it doesn't bother you. Hell yeah, it bothers me, I said, finishing my beer. But I can't just up and vow revenge on my neighbor. This isn't the Old West, and my name isn't Hatfield or McCoy. All right, it's your decision, but if it were me. It's not you, so let's just drop it. Consider it dropped, he said. I won't bring it up again. 
I came home and settled on the couch to watch some TV missing Jack jumping up beside me when the phone rang. Hello? I said. Are you kidding me? James, the neighbor from across the street said. Am I kidding you about what? You let old man Johnson kill your dog and you ain't gonna do nothing about it. So much for Steve dropping it, I said with a sigh. Man, you've got to tell someone, report it or something. Report what? That my dog was digging up the neighbor's flowers, then suddenly got sick and died? Yeah, he said. You got to report that. Okay, and what evidence do I have that he did anything? Come on. No, really. Jack could have gotten into anything outside, I said. Maybe he got tangled up with a snake and got bit. I mean, that could be, James said. But don't you think? I'm trying not to right now, I said. But thanks for you and Steve trying to whip me into a frenzy over it. Sorry, man. I just don't want old man Johnson to walk all over you, he said. He's done that with so many others. That's why the house was so cheap. The last guy that lived there disappeared mysteriously. So what do you want me to do? Go all John Wick and blow the dude away? I... I'm not saying that, James said. I just don't think he should get away with it. Okay, I'm done talking now. I'm gonna watch some TV and go to bed. Well, if you need anything. I won't be calling you or Steve. I hung up the phone and immediately regretted it. I knew they were just concerned, but I didn't want to think about it right now. I looked over at the empty spot on the couch where Jack had been lying. I could see him lift his head as if to ask, what's wrong? Are we going outside? Do you want to play ball? All within the space of a few seconds while he wagged his tail at warp speed. I turned off the TV and dragged myself to bed. I didn't want to think about today or tomorrow or anything else for that matter. Eventually, I fell asleep. I woke to the sound of knocking. It wasn't forceful, but it was enough to wake me up. I looked over at my alarm clock and it said 10.18 in the morning. I'd overslept. Luckily, it was Saturday and although there were things I wanted to do, they weren't urgent. I got up and stumbled to the door. When I opened it, I was surprised to see Mr. Johnson standing there looking unhappy as usual. Good morning, I said with a yawn. Listen here, he said. I just came over to see when you were going to pay for the flowers that mutt of yours ruined. I blinked. He couldn't have said what I thought I just heard him say. Excuse me? I said. You know, all the flowers that mangy mud of yours dug up, you're going to pay me for them. You do realize he passed away yesterday, I said, trying to stay calm. Yup, he said, and you had nothing to do with that, I said in my most sarcastic voice. I absolutely did not, he said. Something about how he said it made me not believe him. I'll tell you what, I said, feeling my blood start to boil. You buy me a new dog, and I'll pay for your stupid flowers. I didn't have anything to do with what happened to your dumb dog, he growled. And I didn't have anything to do with what happened to your flowers, I said, then pushed the door closed. He jammed his foot in the door and leaned inside. Be careful, he said quietly, or you might find yourself joining your precious puppy. He pulled his foot out, and the door slammed shut. I stood there in a daze. He had just threatened me. I had no doubt he had killed my dog. I went to the kitchen, still dazed, and got a beer out of the fridge. I brought it back to the living room and sat down on the couch, still thinking about what he'd said. I finished drinking, and before I knew it, there were five empty cans sitting on my coffee table. I heard the neighbor's car rumble out of his garage and watched out my living room window as he drove away toward town. My list of things I wanted to do today just got pushed aside. I went to my garage and got out my rototiller. 
I started it up and guided it around the side of the house, headed for the backyard where I wanted to plant my garden. As I passed between my house and the neighbors, I saw the flowers he had replaced and suddenly thought of Jack. I swerved toward his house without thinking about it. When I got to the flower bed, I engaged the blades and shredded the entire thing. After I was done, I steered back over to my backyard, whistling a happy tune. I got to where I wanted my garden, right behind the house, and started ripping up grass. I ran back and forth over the patch I wanted to dig up. At least, that was the plan. If someone would have had a camera recording me, they definitely would have been able to send it in to one of those funny video shows. This was my first time running my rototiller. I started out setting the depth too low, and when I engaged the drive wheels, the tines dug in and took me for a ride. I didn't realize I had it set on fast speed. I raced along running behind the machine, desperately trying to grab the handle that turned the power wheels off. Eventually, I was able to stop it and take a breather. The next time was nearly as bad. I set it to low speed, but it didn't want to go anywhere, so I had to push with all my might to get it to move. I had no desire to switch it back to high. Just when I was about to give up, it suddenly caught and took off, dragging me along behind it as I desperately reached for the lever to stop it. After about an hour of this, I needed a break. I went inside to get a drink. When I came back out, my neighbor was leaning on my rototiller, looking very unhappy. What do you think you're doing? He said. Just trying to plant a garden. You destroyed my flowers, he said through gritted teeth. I looked over toward his house. Oh my, I said, holding my hand up to my mouth in mock shock. How on earth did that happen? You know damn well how it happened, he growled. I'm calling the police. While you're at it, make sure to tell them how you poisoned my dog, I said, starting up my rototiller. Oh yeah, that mutt that was too stupid not to eat the steak that was laying in the flowers. My eyes burned with hatred. It was one thing to suspect someone of something so heinous. It was something else entirely to have them admit it and shove it in your face. I turned away to keep myself from decking him and ending up in jail. But when I did, I bumped the controls, sending the rototiller forward with the blades digging up the ground. Unfortunately, he was standing right beside it and his foot got caught in the blades. He screamed in pain as I struggled to stop the machine. He lay there in agony as blood poured from his nearly severed foot. You bastard. I'll make sure you go to prison for the rest of your life, for this. I looked down at him and realized he would do it. The man who had murdered my dog was going to make sure I went to jail, and he would probably get away with it. It was his word against mine. My mind was flooded with all the evil that runs rampant in this world. Rage filled me at the thought of such an injustice being allowed to go unpunished. Something in my head snapped. I saw Jack happily digging in his flower bed. Then I saw him eating the steak that had been laid out and getting sick. I looked down at this horrible man and knew what I had to do. I engaged the rototiller and drove right over him, the blades tearing into him as I went. He screamed until I got to his face and the blades ripped through it, making him mute when they tore out his tongue. I turned and ran back over him again as he tried to crawl away, but I steered the machine toward him, ripping chunks of flesh and turning the soil a deep red hue. I turned and ran over him again, squishing organs out into the ground and grinding them up. Somehow, he was still moving. His hand, what was left of it, raised up in a stop sign which I tilled over. Back and forth, I went over and over that section of ground until there was nothing left but dark, moist dirt and some larger bones the machine couldn't grind up. I went to the garage and got my shovel, dug a hole right in the middle of my garden and buried his bones and shreds of clothes there. I covered them up with dirt and proceeded to plant over top of it. When I was done, I stepped back and looked at my nicely tilled garden that was planted and ready to grow. 
I turned my tiller back towards the house and nearly ran over Steve. What the hell did you do? He said. What do you mean? I said, feeling the sweat starting to form on my forehead. You know exactly what I mean, he said. I... You've never run that tiller before, have you? He said. No, I... And you didn't think to call me? Well, I wah. That's all right, buddy, he said, smiling as he clapped his hand on my back. It was worth it watching you being dragged around. You... you watched me? I said, feeling the cuffs close around my wrists. Nearly peed myself laughing, he said. I just wish I could have seen the whole thing. Oh, so you didn't see all of it? I said, breathing a mental sigh of relief. Nah, as much as I wanted to, I got dragged away. Oh, you didn't miss anything, I said with a nervous chuckle. Well, next time, give me a holler before you run that thing, he said. You're lucky you didn't kill anyone. I laughed, trying to hide the desperation in it as I glanced at the machine and saw spots of liquid on the side. I was never so glad in my life that the tiller was painted red. We don't want that, I said, turning my tiller back toward the garage. Maybe you can practice some more by tilling up my garden, Steve said, following alongside me. I think I've had enough for one day, I said as we reached the garage. Yeah, you should take a break, he said. You look dead tired. I laughed a little too loud as he walked away toward his house. Once inside the garage, I closed the door and propped up the machine. I went into the house, got cleaning supplies, including bleach, and cleaned the blades until they shone like new. The whole time I couldn't keep my hands from shaking thinking about what I'd done. Afterward, I went inside and took a long shower, then drank myself into a stupor and passed out on the couch. I woke up with a massive headache and stiff muscles from my fight with the tiller. The tiller, I thought. What do I do about it? I thought for a long time before it hit me. I don't have to do anything about it. No one saw me do it. I thought back to Steve and how quickly he showed up. Did he really not see what happened? I tried to put it out of my head and go on with my life. I went to work on Monday and did my job the best I could. By Wednesday, I was doing good and was nearly back to normal. People had given me space, assuming I was morose and standoffish because of my dog, so I let them think that. On Thursday, I got a knock on my door. When I opened it, there was a police officer standing there. Good evening, sir, he said. I wonder if I could ask you some questions about your neighbor. Which neighbor? I said. Mr. Johnson. He said, looking at his tablet. What about him? It seems he may have gone missing. Missing? Yes, sir. The last he was seen was Saturday. Really? Do you recall the last time you saw him? Images of bloody dirt, a hole full of bones, and his last desperate gesture of raising his hand to make me stop rushed through my head. Sir, the officer said. Oh, sorry. It may have been Saturday. I saw him last. Did he mention about going anywhere? Like a trip or anything? Not that I recall, I said. Oh, wait. I believed he mentioned taking a trip to Australia. Something about going down under. The officer flipped back through his pages. Are you sure? He said. I don't have anything on that. Pretty sure, I said trying to look certain. He looked at me and then scribbled a note on his pad. Have you seen any strangers in the area? Maybe they look like they were casing the place? No, I haven't seen anyone like that. He scribbled on his pad. What about you? He said. What about me? How did you get along with your neighbor? Were you close? I wouldn't call us close, I said. We had our disagreements. He scribbled something on his pad. Oh, is that important? I said. You never know, he said, staring at me. What did you disagree about? 
Nothing, really, just his flowers. What about his flowers? Just that my dog would get into them and dig them up every once in a while. And that upset him? Yes. The officer looked around me towards the inside of my house. Where's your dog now? He, um, died. When did that happen? Just last week. Was the dog old? Not really. No. Then what was the cause of death? Poison. He stopped scribbling on his pad and looked up at me. Poison? I nodded. Do you know if there was any foul play involved? I made some kind of motion that was halfway between a head shake and a shrug. So does that mean you don't know? No, I really don't know. Wait, you said your neighbor was upset about his flowers getting dug up by your dog. Is there any way your neighbor had anything to do with the dog's death? Ugh, no, I can't imagine him doing anything like that. Hmm, the officer said. For the longest moment of my life, he just stared at me. I knew he had seen right through me. I had no doubt he was about to pull the cuffs off his belt and haul me away to prison. What was he waiting for? Was this some sick, sadistic tactic they taught cops when they wanted to sweat a confession out of someone? I couldn't take it. I opened my mouth to tell him everything. Well, I won't take up any more of your time, he said. If you think of anything important, don't hesitate to call. Yes, of course, I said. I hope you find him. He nodded and turned back toward the driveway getting in his car and moving on to the next house. Steve's house. Would Steve say he saw me doing something suspicious in the yard Saturday? I watched as the officer got out of his car and walked up to Steve's doorway. Halfway there, he paused and looked over at me. I dove into the house and slammed the door, breathing hard. He knows, I thought. I tried to calm down, but my heart was racing. I drank a beer but that didn't help much. I wanted to drink another but was afraid if he came back over, I would spill my guts. I kept an eye on Steve's house. The officer seemed to be in there for a long time, much longer than he was at my house. Finally, he came out laughing, Steve following along with a big grin on his face. He looked over at my house and I ducked behind the curtain. He drove away, not bothering with the rest of the houses on the block. I knew then that Steve had ratted me out. I just didn't understand why the officer didn't come back and arrest me. The phone rang and I nearly jumped out of my skin. My shaking hand hovered over it for a moment, then picked it up. Hello? You all right there, buddy, Steve said. You seem a little off today. I saw you peeking through the curtain. Just wanted to see where the officer went next. Oh, him. You don't have to worry about him, Steve said. He's cool. Worried, I said. Who said I was worried? My bad then. You just seemed like... Hey, I've got another call. I'll talk to you later. Okay, if you need. I hung up the phone and dropped it on the floor. I collapsed into bed, hoping it wouldn't be the last time I slept on a decent mattress and fell into a fitful sleep. The officer never came back. The next day, the sun rose just like it was supposed to. I started coming out of my funk and returning to normal. Within a few days, I recovered enough to weed my garden. I love to say I didn't move much more quickly through the parts of the garden that had blood and bones in it, but that would be a lie. I laid down black plastic once the seedlings popped up through the ground so I wouldn't have to go out and get rid of weeds. It was the longest summer I'd ever experienced. Every morning I would look out at my garden and then try my best to forget about it through the rest of the day. Sometimes I was successful, sometimes not. The end of summer harvest party was rapidly approaching. Every year, a different house on the block hosted a party where everyone brought something, mostly from their gardens and we had a feast. This year, it was my turn. Two days before the party, 
Steve came over and helped me harvest my corn. You know, it's the strangest thing, Steve said. I've never seen red tassels on corn before. What do you mean? I said. The tassels on top of the corn stalks. They're red instead of yellow, he said. But only in these two spots. Sweat poured from my forehead that had nothing to do with the weather or doing work. That's so odd, I said, trying to keep my voice from shaking. We finished picking the corn and took the bags to the back deck. You want help shucking them? He said. No, I'm good. I'm gonna take a little break before I start. All right, if you need any help getting ready for the party, just let me know. He slapped my back and I smiled as he walked over to his house. I dragged the bags into the garage and leaned them against the rototiller. I went in and got buckets, then shucked every last ear of corn, checking each one for even the slightest hint of red. Fortunately, I didn't find any. I was so tired, I went to my bedroom and plopped in bed, falling instantly asleep. The party was in full swing. Everyone from the neighborhood was there, laughing and talking, and having a great time. We said a blessing, and started through the line to get some food. I waited until last, like a good host, and had just picked up a plate when I heard the first scream. I looked over and a woman's dress was covered in blood. She was screaming at the top of her lungs, but I couldn't see how she'd gotten injured. Next came a scream from the other side of the room. Another woman's blouse was doused in blood. Next came a man shouting as blood covered him. I looked around the room and saw blood everywhere. I couldn't fathom what was happening. Was there some food poisoning happening? And then I saw it. A young man had just bit into one of my ears of corn when blood spurted out of it, covering him. I looked around the room and everyone else who was covered in blood was either holding or had just dropped an ear of corn. I ran over and grabbed the plate of corn just to have all the ears erupt, sending showers of blood all over me. Suddenly, the screaming stopped. It was you, a bloody woman said, pointing at me. It was you, proclaimed the man with his finger aimed in my direction. It was you. It was you. It was you came the chant from all corners of the room as they all closed in on me. I woke with a start, sitting bolt upright in bed, eyes darting around for the people closing in on me. But I was alone. I thought about it all that day. How could I back out of hosting the party? I called Steve that evening. Hey man, I'm really feeling under the weather, I said. I'm not sure we should have the party here tomorrow. I don't want anyone getting sick. Oh wow, man, that's not good. Maybe we can have it at my place instead. I think that would be better. Sure thing, man. Just bring your corn over so we can have it for tomorrow. My corn? Of course, we need your corn. It wouldn't be a harvest party without corn. I... You know what? Maybe if I just lay down for a while and see if I feel better. Okay, but let me know before it's too late. I hung up the phone and collapsed to the floor, laying with my arms and legs out like I was about to make a snow angel. I guess I'm stuck, I said to the ceiling. The ceiling didn't answer back. Day of the party came. I was busy trying to decorate as best I could while cleaning up the house and cooking the corn. Steve came over to help, and the guests arrived right around six. I served drinks, and everyone talked and laughed as the music played in the background. Finally, it was time. Steve introduced me as the host and had a moment of silence for all those who couldn't be with us this year. Then it was time for the blessing. I don't remember what I said. But once I said amen, people were already lining up for the food. I stood back and watched, silently praying with each passing person that they wouldn't get a piece of corn. But of course, they all did. 
I saw the first person about to bite into their corn when I heard a scream. Surprisingly, it came from me. I did it. I said, I killed old man Johnson. I ran him over with my rototiller and kept running him over until he was dead. Then I buried his bones in the middle of my garden. Every eye was fixed on me. No one moved. They just stared. It was Steve who first approached me and put his hand on my shoulder. We knew, he said with an odd smile. What? You knew all along? I said. He nodded. I watched you run him over. And you didn't say anything? What did you want me to say? Hey man, good job on killing that cranky old man that no one likes. But you don't know half the story of what that dude did to people in this neighborhood. Killing your dog was mild for him. But I murdered someone. Smiles grew on every face in the room. A few people even chuckled. Welcome to the club, Steve said. Everyone here has murdered someone. Why do you think it's such a quiet neighborhood? My eyes grew wide as I looked around the room full of smiling people. How do you think you bought your house for such a great price? James said with a grin. I looked at Steve, waiting for him to laugh. Waiting for someone to say it was a joke. But no one did. Here, man, Steve said. Have an ear of corn. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Descent into the Unknown for more terrifying stories.